Equilibrium series. I'm pleased to introduce to you Joe Howard, who's a great friend of the College of Optical Sciences. Uh, Joe is a submariner. He got his degree in physics uh, from Annapolis, the U.S. Naval Academy, and then went into the submarine service. And after uh, serving in submarines, he went to uh, graduate school, was going to study physics, but he instead ended up in, uh, in optics at the University of Rochester. And since getting his PhD from Rochester, he's been an optical designer at Goddard Space Flight Center and worked on a whole series of terrific instruments. And I'm really looking forward to uh, your talk, Joe. And thank you so much for coming and meeting with us. Great. Thank you, Russ. Uh, can everybody hear me? All right, so I'm currently not on speaker, maybe, maybe not, uh, but if you need me to go on speaker, just let me know. Um, um, this talk is mostly for the students and the young people in the audience that uh, don't know a lot about NASA and how it works and all the telescopes. So I hope this enlightens you on that. If you saw the International Optical Design Conference, uh, which was online this past summer, it's very similar to my plenary talk on that, but updated for what's going on. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I hope to make it sort of a, an informal um, discussion uh, to, to uh, the Optical Sciences Center here. Quick note about choosing uh, um, my graduate school. At the time, uh, when I got out of the Navy, the Cold War ended. You know, the submarine force was dropping down from 120 boats down to 60 boats. And whenever you're in an environment of contraction, you know, it's never a happy environment. So I got out and I was accepted to a few grad schools for physics. And uh, in the catalog for all these physics grad schools, there was one for optics. And it was the Institute of Optics up in Rochester, New York. And uh, all my family's on the East Coast, so I limited my search to the East Coast. Uh, and I got, I said, oh, this looks cool, and it's a free application. I'll go there. And I, I was accepted. And then when I visited every physics department at the time, the students were unhappy. They weren't getting hired. Uh, a, a physics professor position had 200 applicants, and you know it was just a miserable time to be a physics uh, graduate student. Up in Rochester, as an optics student, everybody was happy. Everybody was getting hired, and it was just a no-brainer. I mean, so my advice as you follow your career path, uh, definitely choose a uh, happy environment or organization with a high morale, and uh, and that's a big reason why I ended up in NASA as well. All right, so uh, thank you for the great introduction, uh, Russ. Uh, and thank you to the colloquium committee, Dal Wilson and Russ, for uh, choosing me and inviting me. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't invited. And to the dean, uh, Tom Koch, for inviting me as well and sending the application, or sending me the, the, le the letter which justified to my supervisors that I could take this time off. I had a lot of great discussions with faculty today. Uh, I really didn't expect that much. So. So uh, the, uh, uh, the college has been very uh, warm and welcoming. So thank you. It's been wonderful chatting with you all. And thank all of you for coming to listen. OK, so NASA Space Telescopes. So I've got some basic questions uh, to begin with. You know, why telescopes? And here I am at the, perhaps the home of telescopes in all of, the, all of America or the world even. Uh, so it should be a simple answer. Uh, why space? And then finally, why NASA? So telescopes, you know, telescopes are the natural choice for instruments used to directly observe distant objects to uh, emit light, right? No brainer. Uh, because they have an infinite conjugate, or they're looking at infinity, and uh, they bring light to a focus uh, or, or something in your instrument. And another thing is telescopes are also used to indirectly observe phenomena, such as gravity waves, stretching of space, through uh, large baseline interferometers. And uh, that'll be a subject of a different talk. But if you think of uh, LIGO, which is a ground-based interferometer for gravity waves, uh, you know, we're, right now the European Space Agency is considering a space equivalent called LISA. And it's a, kind of an interesting concept, but that's a, a very separate talk. So why space? Well, one of the main reasons to go to space is there's no atmosphere. And so that results in basically better resolution because you don't have turbulence from the air and absorption. You can see all the wavelengths, right? So you're not getting all of that uh, absorption. It's a very stable environment, which is nice, because you can uh, orbit with a, essentially a constant exposure to the sun, so your thermal environment stays uh, the same as opposed to the sunrise, sunset sort of cycle and day-night uh, thermal changes. Um, uh, and also, space can get very cold, which is very good for infrared astronomy. So for atmospheric absorption, I like this plot. Um, it gives you an idea of the, uh, where did the laser pointer go? Lost it already. Holy cow. Here it is. Um, so if you look at the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, the wavelengths of light, uh, and, and look at the transmission, or the, excuse me, the atmospheric opacity, um, 
So it's 100% opaque in these very short wavelengths. In fact, some of the earliest uh, space telescopes uh, were uh, focusing on ultraviolet and X-ray type uh, uh, telescopes because you can't see it essentially from the ground. Here's the visible spectrum, which we do have a hole in the atmosphere. Uh, that's why we can see color. Uh, and then uh, throughout the infrared, there's another uh, a big blocking zone in the atmosphere. And that's why there's a lot of infrared space telescopes uh, that we send up. Uh, you don't see that many radio observatories in orbit because you can do that really well from the ground. Um, and then uh, very, very long wavelengths, uh, you know, these are huge. Uh, they're also blocked. Um, there are some great locations within space that are extremely stable. And a favorite one that's uh, really in vogue are the, is a, a Lagrange point, which are L2. Uh, L2 is uh, one of the, uh, the five Lagrange points. So each of these five points are stable gravity points in the Sun-Earth system. So here's the Sun, here's the Earth, and if you essentially um, mathematically figure out what the gravity looks like at each one of these points based upon these two mass objects, you get these five relatively stable points. Um, and uh, there are zero points in the gravity. Some are unstable, some are stable, but uh, they're great points to have a, a uh, um, essentially a, a need for low amounts of fuel to orbit those points. Okay, so you can stay there a very long time with the minimal amount of fuel in your spacecraft. So L1, which is between Earth and the Sun, is a favorite location to look at the Sun. You don't have to worry about the Earth or anything else in front of you except for maybe Mercury and Venus. Uh, L2, on the other hand, if you're uh, doing astronomy, uh, that's a great spot because you're always behind the Earth and looking away, and you don't have to deal with the Earth and Moon uh, as well as uh, other bright objects that are in the Sun. They're always behind you. And finally, Space background is very, very cold. So the cosmic background temperature is about 3 Kelvin. And so with sun shields and cryostats, you can cool your entire observatory down to essentially less than 10 K, or passively down to less than 35 K. Uh, so that is great for doing infrared astronomy because then the instrument itself that you're using is cold, and so you don't have that self-emission that you have to deal with. Uh, this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, which is the, uh, from the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And and you can see all these fluctuations. Okay, finally, why NASA? Well, our vision statement is we reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind. And our mission, to drive the advances in science, technology, aeronautics, space exploration, enhanced knowledge, education, et cetera, et cetera. But look at the very first one, I mean science. That is the number one in the mission statement for NASA. And that's really cool. Uh, so the vision statement plus the mission, I mean, this is one of the big reasons why I chose to work at NASA. And if you want to work for an organization like that, then definitely come consider us. Uh, the morale at NASA, I didn't put a slide on this, but for the last 10 years running, uh, the federal government puts out a, a, a survey to all of its employees in each one of the agencies, such as you know, the Department of the Navy, the Department of you know, Defense, the Department of Education, NASA. And uh, in 10 years running, NASA has always been number one in employee satisfaction and, and mission. Uh, just the, the, the people love to work there. And why wouldn't we? I mean, we get a lot of money to build these really cool toys and instruments and space instruments and stuff like that. So it, it, it's, a, it's a really great place to work. So why NASA space telescopes? Well, uh, to drive the advances in science, in this case, I'm going to talk mostly about astrophysics today. And uh, astrophysics is essentially humans, uh, humankind's uh, scientific endeavor to understand the universe and our place in it. And the astrophysics division at, uh, and the science mission director at NASA essentially boils it down to these three questions right here. So what are we doing with this money that we get uh, uh, for NASA? Yeah, we're trying to answer the questions. How did our universe begin and evolve? How did galaxies, stars, and planets come to be? And finally, are we alone? So I mentioned money. How much money does NASA get? Over the years, uh, this has been our budget. So we were founded in uh, 1958, and, uh, and this is what it's been looked like. This is the Apollo era, where uh, uh, as a percentage of, the percentage of the federal budget is the y-axis here. So we were over 4%. I mean, if you think of the full federal budget, that's, that's a, big, a big chunk of change. Now we're down about a half percent, and we've been that way for a very long time. Um, and it's, you know, slightly sloping south is from a percentage perspective. But... Um, but we leveled out around 23, 24 billion dollars is, is what our annual, annual. I guess it's 24.7 is what the request went to uh, uh, for our budget. 
and it's on the order of $25 billion, but uh, uh, the current administration upped it about 6%. Uh, big uh, chain, big uh, themes this year are to build on the Earth Systems Observatory um, and keep NASA on the path to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. And finally, to strengthen inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, uh, both within NASA and among the space community. So $24.7 billion is, was, was our request. I, I, I don't recall offhand how much we got, but it's probably on the order of that. Now, how much goes to astrophysics? So of that $24.7 billion, about $1.6 billion goes to astrophysics itself. And this is what it, the, uh, the, uh, over the last many fiscal years, of what, what that money has gone into. So uh, Webb is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it was starting up in uh, early 2000 or so, and you can see it, it just slowly got bigger and bigger, but now it's starting to uh, get small again as we get closer to launch. Roman is the Roman Space Telescope. That's the next flagship mission for astrophysics. I'm going to get into that a little bit. And then there's this little uh, decadal survey wedge, which I'll talk about, which is going to be the next one after Roman, the follow-on, um, uh, the follow-on flagship telescope. But in general, you see these flagship telescopes take up essentially half the astrophysics budgets. The rest of astrophysics here are a bunch of smaller missions like probes and, and whatnot. Um, but uh, but this, is, this is generally the profile of astrophysics, which is you know, we are spending about this much per year in order to answer those three questions. If you do the math and, uh, you, and they divide by the number of people within the U.S., that's about $4.30 per person in the U.S. per year. So, Okay, so now that we have all this money in the astrophysics, in order to answer these questions, how do we decide what to spend the money on? So NASA isn't just given this money and say, okay, um, go answer these questions. We get advice from the scientific community. So we do have our own scientists within NASA, and I'm an engineer, by the way. So my background is optical engineering. Uh, I know a little bit about science because I work with all these scientists. but. Uh, but the, the real advice uh, comes from engaging the world scientific community to determine the priorities of what we should be doing in order to address those questions. Um, so this is typically done once a decade, and it's led by a private nonprofit society of distinguished uh, scholars, uh, which are termed as the National Academies. And they were founded uh, essentially back uh, in the Civil War by President Lincoln um, to become, become an independent, objective advice to the nation on matters relating to science and technology. Okay. So NASA looks to this outside group that is a nonprofit uh, in order to help address that. And how they do that is every 10 years, uh, they produce a decadal report. Okay, so this is the Astrophysics Decadal Survey Missions Report, and it's been about every two years, starting in 1972, 82, 91, 2001, 2010, and this is 2020, 2020 originally, but it's been delayed a little bit because of COVID. So basically, for the rest of the talk here, I'm going to talk about each one of these decadal surveys and the, the primary flagship mission that resulted from it and give you an idea of what the current space telescopes are and the future ones. But first, let's do a little bit of optical design. So I'm going to give you a very quick, simple tutorial on telescope design forms. Uh, we're going to go by the numbers. One mirror, two mirror, three mirrors, and more. Then I'll have a brief slide on freeform because... Uh, I like to touch on freeform. That's one of my little research topics that I do in the background. And a lot of this is based on this book. Uh, Dietrich Korsch was a NASA employee uh, who worked at Marshall Space Flight Center. And uh, this is a really wonderful book if you're into reflective optics. Uh, he really, really uh, uh, did a good, uh, thorough job for everything. So throughout this book, uh, we only considered center systems. That's on page one. I love that. And if, you ever, if you're a geometrical optics uh, a person who likes looking at the books, Oftentimes, when you uh, look on page one, they'll, they'll say, this, uh, this theory depends upon rotational symmetry or something like that. And, 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 it's, and he does it right there. And that's very important because uh, you, you always need to remember that, especially when you break into the freeform world. Because once you break symmetry, things change, right? Whether you go to plane symmetry or uh, just a total broken symmetry, it all changes. All right, so uh, real quick. Telescope aperture specifications. This is something that most of you should have seen in your geometric optics courses. Um, I'm going to briefly mention F number quite a bit and APD, which are entrance pupil diameter. So entrance pupil diameter is merely the size of the beam that's coming into the telescope, right? And then you have a focal length associated with your telescope. 
And the F number simply is the focal length divided by the entrance pupil diameter. So it gives you a sense of that cone angle right there, that speed. So a smaller F number means you have a, a, a t uh, faster beam or a tighter cone, and a larger F number means it's, it's you know, a very, very long focal length, and, and it's, um, uh, you, you just have a much longer focal length. And, and, uh, um, let's see. Okay, so one of the things when you're defining a mission is you receive a bunch of requirements from your science partners and say, we need to have a certain amount of image quality over a certain field of view. And for reflective systems, it's kind of straightforward to determine, well, if you want a certain field of view with a certain image quality, for rotationally symmetric telescopes, that kind of drives you into a minimum number of mirrors that you need to have good imaging for that field of view. So here's a simple uh, way to look at it uh, for one, two, uh, one mirror systems, two mirror systems, and three mirror systems, is on the x-axis, we have a field of view, uh, in this case, an arc minutes, and on the y-axis is uh, essentially just a wavefront error plot. You know, how much wavefront error does uh, the system produce as you increase the field of view? So for a one mirror system, which essentially is just an off-axis parabola, it's a perfect solution for a, a single field point on axis, as you increase the field of view, the wavefront error increases linearly, right? So you get a linear response in your performance as a function of field um, uh, for, that, for that design form. Now for a two mirror system, uh, you get a quadratic response. But you can sort of play games with it and say, well, if it's going to be quadratic, why don't we make it a little bit bad at the center and it gets better and then comes off. So you can sort of have a, a relatively good field of view uh, for a little bit further that you want it. A lot of this is likely due to field curvature, but anyway, it's, it's a quadratic response. Now for a three mirror uh, system, which is referred to as a, a TMA, uh, three mirror anastigmat, uh, essentially your third order blur terms go to zero. So you get a much wider field of view. And you're gonna see different uh, uh, systems as I show you, either one, two, or three mirrors. And, uh, and just, re just remember the more mirrors you have, the more degrees of freedom, the better image quality you get, the bigger fields of view. So it's all basic stuff. Uh, more mirrors equals better image quality, right? So OAP, off-axis uh, off parabola, rich creation design, that's a two mirror, and TMA is a three mirror anastigmat. Okay, so one mirror telescope. This is a, a Newtonian telescope, 17th century concept. Uh, one mirror corrects essentially one of your third order aberrations. Spherical is usually the um, chosen, so it's perfectly uh, imaging the uh, uh, point at infinity on axis. Your field is limited by coma in that case. And the radius essentially sets the focal length, and your conic, by definition, is minus one. Okay, that is the problem. Uh, single reflection essentially limits losses for short wavelengths. So this is a great design for very short wavelength telescopes. If you have a, uh, for example, the NASA's FUSE mission, it's a far UV spectroscopic explorer, uh, you, you get all of your focusing with uh, one bounce, which is great, but your field is certainly limited. Uh, the math is quite simple for a one mirror telescope, the curvature, we already talked about the con conic constant, it's minus one, but the curvature is just determined by the desired focal length that you want. It's just a simple one over two F. And that gives you a perfect stigmatic image on axis. For a two mirror telescope, uh, this is seen as the traditional sort of 20th century telescope design. Uh, the best way to get your image quality from a third order aberration perspective is to uh, choose a Ritchie creation style. Now you could do a Cassegrain where you get perfect imaging on axis, uh, but this gives you a little bit better field by doing the Ritchie creation, where, is it, where, you, where you let the, uh, the conic constants relax to correct two mirrors for two aberrations. So in this case, spherical and coma are the ones that hit you the worst, so you want to correct those. Field is limited by astigmatism, okay? So as your field gets bigger, your astigmatism is going to grow, and it grows as quadratic with field, and that's why you see those quadratic field responses that I showed you on the previous slide. A great example of a rich creation design is NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a F, well, I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but it's an F24 type two mirror uh, telescope. For the equations for two mirror telescopes, so this is all analytical, it's rotationally symmetric, it's well defined. Your curvatures are constrained by your desired distance between your primary and secondary mirror, that's D2. And uh, D1, I'm sorry, D1 is the primary and secondary mirror. D2 is your image distance or your back focal uh, distance if you want to think of it as. F is your focal length, so your curvatures are constrained um, by that. Curvature one, curvature two, the two mirrors, and your conic constants are constrained in a rich creation world to be, essentially be this uh, uh, 
this code right here, which I just copied out of my macro in order to do this solve. So the conic constants and curvatures are completely constrained, and all you have to do is choose your focal length and your two distances, and you have a complete uh, Ritchie creation solution. So piece of cake. Three mirror telescope. So three mirror telescopes were introduced uh, analytically by Dietrich Korsch uh, and the TMA form. So three mirrors essentially corrects three aberrations, right? Each mirror, you get one of each of the third order aberrations. In this case, spherical, como, and astigmatism. Those are the ones that cause blur in your image. Okay, your field is generally limited by higher order terms in this case. And a great example of that is NASA's James Webb Telescope, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so this is generally what they look like. You have a big primary, secondary. The front end looks a lot like a Cassegrain telescope, but the focus in here is blurry. Um, and then the tertiary sort of uh, uh, balances that out and, and just causes, a, and it's more of a field mirror. There's a lot more um, a field associated with this, so you're able to get this uh, sort of astigmatism control. And here are the equations for a TMA. So this is straightforward again. They're published. You could code that up, and you get yourself a, Three conic constants, totally constrained by these equations. Uh, your curvatures, you can set those two of the curvatures for a desired first order parameter, such as you know focal length, back focal length. But then you get an additional one to play with. Now that could either be desired to be, you know, my manufacturer can only make me an F1 mirror, so I'm going to fix the primary mirror to F1. Uh, or you could say I definitely want a flat field for this telescope. So let's uh, use that extra curvature to make the field flat, and you can uh, constrain that curvature for that. But that, that becomes an open sort of thing. In the case for James Webb, we actually wanted a uh, curved image, which was uh, uh, the curvature of the image is the distance from the, uh, the, the fast steering mirror, but I'll talk about that in a little bit, which is very convenient if you're, you're tipping and tilting that mirror for uh, fine guiding. And finally, four mirrors. Uh, some people call it a four mirror anastigmat, but essentially it's just a four mirror telescope. I like to think of it as four mirrors. How many aberrations? You get four. So you get the three blur aberrations, spherical, coma, and astigmatism. And you can even use one for distortion control, which might be nice if it's a, a telescope that's looking, if it's flying over, say, a planet, and you're doing uh, scanning with it, uh, it, it. Distortion becomes important because if you're exchanging information on your detector from one row of pixels to the next row of pixels, you kind of want the same mapping of the pixels on what you're looking at as you do that. Otherwise, they're going to be wandering uh, pixel rows, and that's not good for your science. Uh, the curvatures are also set by first order, like I said, but uh, you can even constrain primary mirror F number in this case and include Petzval curvature, so that's one way to, to play with that. Uh, your field for this telescope generally is limited by higher order blur terms. So this looks a lot like a JWST type scale telescope, except uh, in JWST, this mirror was completely flat. In this case, it actually has a little bit of curvature and a conic on it in order to do the distortion control. But the four mirror telescopes come in all different design forms. Um, there's papers out there that talk a lot about it. Finally, freeform designs. These are really starting to push the boundaries. There's some research going on in this. Um, so freeform mirrors are essentially just mirrors with more degrees of freedom beyond the curvature and conic that I've been talking about. And there's ways to uh, define them. Um, you, my favorite are XY polynomials, uh, but a lot of people like to use Zernike's or Q polynomials, which are the, the Forbes polynomials uh, that uh, fabricators like to use. Um, more degrees of freedom, give you wider field of view, faster F number, improved image quality. You can put it in a smaller package, uh, reduce the number of optics. So if you only need uh, two mirrors and that's good enough for your science, uh, in a normal system, you might need three, but freeform might get you down to two, which may be good for shorter wavelengths. You have uh, more of a throughput. Uh, less sensitivity, just like I was saying. And uh, uh, so for uh, this bullet right here, sometimes freeform systems, if you design them right, your tolerances are better than it would be for a rotationally symmetric system. And that's a surprising result, but it, it's true. If you design it right, you can actually get that case. And uh, a larger spectral bandwidth, um, is nice as well if you have a spectrometer where you use a freeform, say, as part of your grading or something like that. Um, the cost for freeform, once you break symmetry, you have to deal with a lot more aberrations in your system. So it's very helpful to understand uh, uh, how your symmetry is broken and the aberrations that result. This is a nice uh, bubble chart that I like to look at. And if you've taken an optical design course, uh, I'm, you're, I'm sure you've seen uh, the sort of uh, classic bubble chart by Warren Smith. Well, this is one by uh, Julie Bentley. Um, 
one of my friends at uh, uh, where I took uh, optical design at the University of Rochester, and it's essentially F number versus field of view. And for reflective systems, you know, if you have a requirement that says, hey, I need an F5 telescope for a two degree field of view, you know, the Schmidt Cassegrain gives you an idea of, hey, where do you start? Well, look at the bubble chart, see where it is. The tougher systems are the, the, uh, the smaller F numbers and the bigger field of view. So this is the direction of toughness and, and freeform is basically going to fill this zone in here if you, if you need it. So, so I'm excited about freeform. Um, you know, making them is uh, certainly not free, but, uh, but in the design world, it's a lot of fun. All right, so let's get back to the decadal surveys. Okay, so the first one, 1972. Uh, this was the winner of the decadal survey was the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, this is essentially what the Hubble Space Telescope is. So the entrance pupil is a 2.4 meter telescope. Okay, the backup mirror for that is hanging in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So if you ever get there, definitely go to the Smithsonian for the uh, Air and Space Museum. You can actually see it. Uh, hanging from the roof, or um, it, it, it's above you when you look at it. And, uh, and the backup mirror, if, um, many of you, I assume, have heard about the original issue with the Hubble. There was a metrology uh, equipment issue where the primary mirror was slightly polished to a slightly uh, different shape and it resulted in a lot of spherical aberration. Well, if you chat with the uh, Kodak guys who made the backup, they'll say their mirror, is, uh, their mirror was correct. Uh, but it's, that's the one that's hanging in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Um, the field of view is about a 14 arc minute radial field of view, and it's an F24 system, okay? And that's just to, uh, so I'm mostly talking about the telescopes themselves. Each one of these space telescopes have an instrument suite on the back. And so it takes the focus light at the telescope image surface and, and relays it within its own instrument, either, you know, uh, doing whatever it's doing, putting it through filters or whatever, but, uh, but at the telescope, this is an F, fundamentally an F24 telescope. The wavelength range for Hubble is uh, 0.12 microns to 2.5 microns, and it is that Ritchie creation design. So it's the two mirror design. Uh, the survey was 1972, and the launch was 1990. Okay, about 18 years from survey to launch. Um, these are those definitions again that I went over at the beginning. So hopefully they'll be uh, you'll have them memorized by now. So the Hubble has been extremely successful. Uh, of all the NASA missions, uh, it has really, I mean, it's still taking science, and it's just fabulous. So on the left here, uh, this is years on the bottom, and these are number of uh, uh, publications, it says publication rate per year. And it, you can see it's just, it, it's still increasing over time. It's just fabulous. The one on the right here is kind of interesting. So uh, in the publication world, a lot of people like to look at indexes and see, you know, uh, um, if you're a faculty, you know, there's um, what is my personal index for publication, that sort of thing. Well, one way to compare different observatories is to something called the H index. And, uh, and, and an H, so the definition of an H index is an index of H has published H papers, each of which has been cited in other papers at least H times. So I got this from the Space Telescope website. Uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute website, and it's, there's other indices out there. I, I'm not advocating this one, but this is just gives you an idea of, um, of the um, a quality metric uh, for the science produced by an observatory. And number one using this quality is the Hubble. Um, and then you've got uh, several ground observatories that are producing a lot of science. And then Spitzer, here's another space observatory, pops in. And then more ground observatories, Chandra, another space observatory, space observatory, ground observatories. Uh, and then you've got some more space observatories out here. Sophia is way out here, by the way. Um, but this is, uh, Hubble's just been really uh, massive, producing tons and tons of science. And it's for everyone. You may submit a proposal to steer the Hubble a certain direction and take a picture that you want. Now you're competing against a, a bunch of astronomers, likely, uh, so you may not win that proposal, but, but anyone can submit. And it doesn't matter. Um, if you're from the United States or if you're from China or whatever, it's just uh, anyone um, of any nationality or affiliation may submit an HST proposal. And that is pretty cool, I think. Okay, moving on to the next two decadal surveys, uh, 1982 and uh, 1991. So in 1982, the Chandra X-ray Telescope was the winner. And that was the, uh, and by winner, I mean the flagship observatory. So each one of these decadal surveys uh, not only say the priority for the big observatories, they also talk a lot about the, you know, the medium and smaller observatories, but I'm not going to talk about those here. I'm just talking about the big ones, the flagships. 
Uh, so the entrance pupil of Chandra is smaller than Hubble, 1.2 meters. Uh, and the field of view is 30 arc minutes, but it's an X-ray telescope. Um, and so a lot of it's gla uh, uh, gla uh, grazing incident design. This is an F8 design, and the wavelengths, um, this is uh, in nanometers now, not in microns. So it's 0.12 to 12 nanometers wavelength for Chandra. It's a Walter type 1 design. Okay, so the X-ray design forms are similar to two mirror concepts. Uh, it's just that the, uh, the way that they... Uh, uh, the grazing de definition of incidence, they always want to keep them go in the same direction, and so that uh, Walter discussed that, uh, and it's a Walter type one design. But it's essentially the uh, same as kind of a Ritchie creation concept, where you're controlling the, the first and second order, or the third order uh, spherical and, and coma type aberrations, but it's a, a, of a grazing incidence. The resolution for Chandra is 0.5 arc seconds, and uh, it was surveyed in 82, launched in 1999. So we're talking uh, 17 years or so. Uh, Chandra recently had its 20-year birthday, and uh, they came out with this poster. I thought this was kind of neat. So 20 years, uh, a lot of scientists have used it, 2.4 uh, billion kilometers traveled, you know. Um, it's in a, in a uh, it's not in a, it's in a different orbit than, uh, than, than Hubble is. Um, um, it's a 63-hour elliptical type, uh, uh, elliptical type orbit. Anyway, lots of interesting numbers. Um, Spitzer was the next one for the uh, uh, decadal survey that was in the early 90s. And that is uh, under a meter, but it's uh, the, the first uh, infrared telescope to win it. Um, so it's a 0.85 meter, and the field of view was uh, 60 by 30 arc minutes. So essentially one degree by half a degree. It's an F12 system, and the wavelengths were, now we're back to microns, 3.6 to 160 microns. It's a Ritchie creation design, so another two mirror design. So all of these so far have just been two mirror designs for the, uh, for the flagship uh, telescopes. Survey was in 91, and the launch was uh, 2003. Spitzer completed its mission, so it's no longer being used on the 30th of January 2020. So one of the biggest things that, uh, that it uh, brought about, and there were many discoveries made by Spitzer, including, uh, including a lot of things that James Webb is going to look at, uh, because that's the next uh, infrared observatory. Uh, but the TRAPPIST system was uh, one of my personal favorites. Uh, you know, it just identified all these different planets that are around the nearby uh, in the TRAPPIST system. And, and I, I kind of like the look of the uh, but space butterfly, one of the pictures that I took. So, uh, SOFIA infrared telescope uh, was also a priority in 1991. It had its first flight in 2007. And in this particular one, it's a little bit bigger, but it's not a space flight observatory. It's an observatory that's based on a 747. So it has the same field of view as Spitzer. Uh, it's an F20 telescope. Uh, the wavelength is 2.5 to 5 microns, and it's a Cassegrain design. Uh, I'm not sure why a Cassegrain was chosen in this case, but, uh, but that, that's what the choice of uh, this particular telescope was. A lot of contributions for the uh, Spitzer. One of the main partners were, were the, was Germany, uh, the uh, DLR, which is, I believe, the uh, German equivalent space agency or, or uh, science agency. So note that uh, in the FY22, the astrophysics budget proposed, I don't know if that happened in the final uh, uh, authorization, but uh, they proposed termination of SOFIA funding due to its high cost and lower scientific productivity than other missions. So the previous chart that I showed you about the, uh, the H index, you know, SOFIA was way at the end. Um, so if that is a quality metric on the feedback for science or a quality metric, you know, it, it, this sort of management decisions do, do get to be made. Now, what may actually happen is NASA is going to say, hey, we're going to shut down, and then Germany uh, may, uh, they may, you know, just pitch in more to keep it going. So we'll see. Okay, next decadal survey, uh, 2001. And the winner of that was the James Webb Space Telescope. So let's talk about that. So uh, JWST uh, is a 6.5 meter aperture, okay, 18 segment telescope. So the primary mirror is not a monolith, okay, these are hexagons that are all arrayed uh, in two rings of hexagons, all in an array, uh, that is a 6.5 meter diameter. The field of view is 20 by 10 arc minutes, and it's an F20 design from uh, wavelengths of 0.6 to 28 microns, okay? So at the, basically the red end of visible, uh, but 28 microns in the mid-infrared. 
uh, the design is a TMA now. We're, now we're talking three mirrors. So this is, uh, you know, we're in the 21st century now. We've gone from two mirrors to three mirrors, TMA. The survey was 2001, and the launch is going to be December 18th, 2021. Um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, we've had some key partners in James Webb, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. So who is James Webb? Uh, so James Webb is named after uh, NASA's second administrator, best known for leading the Apollo missions uh, that landed the first humans on the moon. And he also started basically a vigorous space science program at NASA. So that's why he is honored. Um, he's responsible for more than 75 launches during his tenure, including America's first interplanetary explorers. So why is James Webb an infrared telescope? Well, to see the very first stars and galaxies that formed in the early universe, and that's one of the questions uh, about, uh, uh, for astrophysics, we essentially have to look very deep into space in order to look back in time. And because it takes light time to travel from here to there. Now, since the universe is expanding, uh, the further away you look, the objects that are uh, further away are moving faster away from us, and this causes a red shift in the light, which is the Doppler effect, right? So in order to study the earliest star and galaxy formation in the universe, we have to observe the infrared light. So we're actually seeing what once was optical light, but it's been red shifted into the infrared. Okay? And the instruments are optimized to see this light. So here's another way to look at it. So on the x-axis here, this is uh, time, right? So here's the present day on the left, and as we look back in time uh, to the Big Bang, uh, this is sort of what happened. You know, modern galaxies form in this period, first galaxies form. So uh, Hubble can only see essentially back this far to where modern galaxies were forming. But James Webb is going to look all the way back to when the first galaxies were forming and potential seeing first light, uh, maybe the edge of first uh, star formation. So here we go. We are, uh, the goal of James Webb is essentially to take the baby pictures of the universe. And this is my daughter uh, when I started on the project for James Webb. Um, JWST must be very cold to see the infrared, okay? So passively, we need to get down to 30 Kelvin. How do you get down to 30 Kelvin with a telescope this big? Well, it's a simple recipe. Get a far away from Earth. In this case, we're going to the Sun-Earth Lagrange point, which I uh, showed earlier. And second, we're going to hide in the shade. So there's going to be this huge sunshade right here where the telescope's on the other side of the sunshade compared to where the sun is. And the sunshade not only is going to block the sun, but since the Lagrange point is on the opposite side of the Earth and Moon from the Sun, uh, we'll be blocking light from those as well. So uh, the distance where James Webb is going to is about 1.5 million kilometers or so, about four times, think of it as four times the distance uh, from the, from the uh, Earth to the Moon. Okay? So in theory, I don't know if this is true yet, uh, at nighttime, right, if the Sun's this way and you're looking looking this way, you should probably be able to see glints off this uh, sunshade for James Webb, I'm expecting. But I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, amateur astronomers uh, looking out for it. Uh, here is the uh, picture of the Lagrange points that I mentioned uh, with respect to the sun. L2 is behind the Earth. OK, so uh, what does the telescope look like uh, from a temperature perspective? Well, um, we have the really hot. So this is room temperature in the spacecraft. And that's a box on the bottom. And to separate this really hot, and this is pointed towards the sun and the earth down here, and to separate the hot from the cold up here, we have five sunshade layers. And this is like a, uh, just a multiple thermal blankets in order to get that gradient going from very hot to very cold. And uh, uh, once you get to the top of the sunshade layer, you're at the 70 to 85 Kelvin range. And this is all passive, okay? So we are just looking out to very cold space on this side, that three Kelvin space that I mentioned. And on this side, it's uh, uh, looking at the sun. Uh, we do have some hot electronics back here uh, that are running, uh, that are needed to be close to the detectors for the instruments. Uh, but this, this little flap right here is a radiator in order to get rid of all that heat as much as possible to have the minimal impact on what's going on, uh, the optics in the observatory. Uh, but our instruments are all in, uh, uh, tucked away in this box right here behind it. And so uh, these are kept at 35 to 42 Kelvin. One of the instruments, has to be actively cooled to 6 Kelvin, uh, which is our mid-infrared instrument. And uh, this active cooling uh, gets us, uh, enables us to see down at the 28 micron for the science uh, for mid-infrared astronomy. Uh, the primary mirror segments, that is, the, uh, and, and the secondary mirror, 
are in the 30s to 50 Kelvin. So, so the entire observatory is cooled down to a very cold state for this. Here's another look at the James Webb. Uh, here's the Hubble Space Telescope mirror, 2.4 meters. Here's the James Webb mirror. Uh, gives you a perspective of how big it is. Each one of these are 1.3 meters flat to flat. Um, and so they're about yay high or so. Um, so the bigger mirror uh, helps with the higher spatial resolution if you just think of, uh, you know, lambda by D. Um, but the big thing that is, uh, is, is motivating science is, you know, that it's a big photon collector. So this increased sensitivity is really, really going to be awesome. In fact, here's, uh, here's what the expectation is. On the left, this is the photometric performance of a point source, right? So we've got all the, the ground-based observatories. Um, and then you've got Hubble and Spitzer uh, space base. And JWST is just really going to, you know, orders of magnitude uh, better for photometric performance. Uh, about an order or two of magnitude. And, uh, and then for the spectroscopy, the near spec and mid infrared, I mean, several orders of magnitude better uh, than the current capability. So there is a lot of excitement in the astronomy community about uh, what this is going to provide. Okay, so back to optics. James Webb is a three mirror design. Uh, we have a primary mirror, secondary mirror, and a tertiary mirror. And then there's a flat fold right here, which uh, sends it off to the image surface for the telescope. And this is what's relayed by the instruments. So this flat mirror, this FSM, is a fast steering mirror. And that is at the image of the primary mirror itself. Okay, so that's the exit pupil of the telescope. And uh, this fast steering mirror, uh, so the design of the JWST, the primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, the, I told you about controlling, uh, you have uh, one additional degree of freedom. Uh, you can choose for a flat field to fix your pet's fall, or, and uh, for the case for James Webb, we wanted a curvature of the image itself. Because if you have a tip-tilt mirror at the exit pupil and it's tipping and tilting, uh, if your image surface is curved, then you aren't going to go out of focus when you're doing tipping and tilting control in order to control your line of sight on the sky. Okay? So that's a key point, is that it's a curved image surface, so all the instruments have to uh, basically flatten out that curvature of the image surface when it goes through their individual systems in order to put them on a flat detector, so you don't get that, uh, that focus change as a function of field. Uh, the primary mirror segments for James Webb have uh, been all over the U.S. I mean, they were born in Utah, that's where the beryllium uh, ore plant is, and then they've gone to Ohio to do their uh, packing into the shapes and, and, and down into northern Alabama to do the gr uh, grinding and then back and forth quite a bit. Uh, they've been to uh, Ball Aerospace in Colorado quite a bit. And then finally, uh, the assembly of uh, all these mirrors were assembled onto the telescope at Goddard, where I work. Um, uh, the integration was completed in 2017. We did some system testing uh, at Johnson Space Center uh, at the end of 2017. And for the last couple of years, it's been at uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, but currently it is down in Karoo, French Guiana. So that's really exciting. Uh, here's a few photos of the, uh, the past couple of years for James Webb. This is when it was at Goddard. Uh, this is fully assembled looking at the, uh, there's, we have a big uh, display window that uh, visitors, visitors can look at. And every once in a while the, the telescope has just turned to that so people can take some great photos. This gantry system is where it was assembled. Uh, this room right here is a clean room. It's uh, one of the biggest clean rooms in the world. This whole wall are nothing but HEPA filters in order to uh, keep it at, uh, I think, class 10,000. And uh, it's designed to be, those HEPA filters are designed to be swapped out every, I think, 50 years or something like that, because that's a, a major operation in order to swap that out. Um, here's a, uh, right before we shipped off the uh, JWST, we actually turned it towards this viewing gallery. And uh, here's our Nobel Prize laureate, um, uh, John Mather, taking a, a selfie in the mirror, which is kind of cool, a billion dollar selfie, we like to call it. Note that, uh, so this little hole right here is where the uh, Cassegrain focus is, but you can't see into it because it's, uh, uh, there's a little cover right there. And there's another picture of a cover coming up, one that worries me. Um, <clears throat> when we were down in Houston, uh, back in the Apollo era, uh, there was a gigantic chamber built. And this is a historic landmark right now. So the actual Apollo mission was tested in this monstrous chamber. Well, that's the only one. NASA had two chambers to consider to test this. One was uh, in Plum Brook, Ohio. Uh, which was uh, uh, used for spacecraft, and it was contemplating being used for nuclear propulsion of the spacecraft at one point. Uh, but the other one was down in Houston. And so Houston uh, uh, won the sort of trade uh, that we did to see where to go. But we had to upgrade this uh, 
this uh, chamber here in order to make it down to 30 Kelvin, right? So we had to have a helium shroud and all sorts of stuff. And, and then, uh, and, and the telescope just barely fit in through the main door with the secondary deployed. So that was kind of cool. It's kind of fun working there. This is first, first light of the primary mirror. That's how we verified the primary mirror uh, was in that chamber because we could set up a center of curvature interferometer to look at it. And uh, this is the best uh, phasing under gravity. So all the segments, you can see all the gravity in the segments right here. Uh, one of the mirrors was bumped against something, so there's a little, little, um, little, little, bit, little bit of an issue right there that was unexpected. Uh, but we got down to uh, minimum. Uh, there's supposed to be about 158 nanometers, but we were about 180 nanometers uh, for this phasing, which was uh, basically the demonstration is that can you uh, align the, the, the telescope mirror? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the thing that was bumped against was not the flight hardware. It was some of the GSC that was right next to it. The ground support equipment, uh, the, the test equipment. When uh, James Webb was uh, shipped to Los Angeles, it was done in this big uh, um, chamber right here in the back of one of our uh, Air Force's uh, special satellite carrying uh, C-5 galaxies. This is like a special cargo plane that carries these big national assets. Um, the integration of the telescope, the observatory, was uh, made into the bus uh, while in Los Angeles. And this is where the... Uh, the, um, um, like the spacecraft box, uh, I think it's right here, and the sun shader here. Um, and this is what it looks like when, when all that was done. So we have the observatory here. This is the, the sun shade all folded up. Uh, and right before its final deployment testing at Northrop Grumman. And then it was shipped by boat all the way down to French Guiana. So why would you ship it by boat <laughs> when you can fly it anywhere? Well, the reason is kind of weird, um, but uh, at the European launch facility in French Guiana, and um, uh, this is close to the equator, that's why it's there, um, the location of the airport and the location of the launch facility are separated by several bridges or overpasses that are incompatible for large containers like JWST. However, the port is right next to the launch facility, and there's no such obstructions to send a large truck through it. And this is just what the Europeans do. Whenever they have a big satellite, they ship it across the Atlantic by boat and bring it to the port, and they unload it to go to the launch facility. So it's an interesting reason, but that's why it goes by boat to French Guiana. Basically, a few bridges are in the way, and they don't want to take the bridges down or, or repair them or, or whatever is needed. Just a weird, weird sort of thing. Um, so today, uh, James Webb is at the launch site. It arrived, I believe, on October, uh, let's see, if you, there's a date here somewhere, October 20, is that the 21st or something like that? 12th, oh, October 12th, that's it. Um, anyway, and it's going to be launched from this point right here um, uh, from an Arian 5 rocket. Um, it looks like there's an Arian 5 at this one as well. If, if it's a, there's two uh, solid rocket boosters on the side of it. And currently, December 18th is a scheduled launch date. So this is what the uh, that little cover looks like before flight, <laughs> removed before flight. So if this is a, this is a, the lens cover for James Webb right here, and and uh, yeah, I'm sure it will be, but it sort of makes a, an optics guy nervous that you know when you see something like that. <laughs> uh, on the uh, uh, 18 December, uh, after it launches, the first 30 days are all deployment, right? So this is a telescope that's too big for the rocket, so it needs to be folded up to put it inside the rocket. And uh, the deployment sequence looks something like this. And so um, first thing, uh, the sun shades fold back, fore and aft. And then uh, they start to unravel. Uh, and then uh, you'll see the side booms start to come out here. And these are like, if, you're a, uh, if you've ever been on a sailboat, and oh, no, what happened? Oh, here we go. Uh, if you've ever been on a sailboat, I mean, this is like uh, pulling out the jib, but you've got this five... You have five layer of sun shield that's doing it, and it has to wiggle at this uh, perfect amount of time so things don't over tent. And then the tension builds up, and then the five layers start to separate here. Okay, and so once that's all done, um, and it's done each at a time, you can see it fold up. And, and there's a lot better videos online if you want to look at this more, but I'm giving you the, the quick one minute one. Um, and then we should see the deployment of the tower here for the telescope here shortly. Um, or maybe that already happened. See, as it slowly rotates, okay, the second memory comes down, the wings deploy, and then now the telescope is ready to begin its several month alignment, optical alignment, essentially. Yep. For James Webb, at the bottom of this is a big solar array. 
so there's a the battery is charged before it launches but the uh, let's see if I have a better picture but uh, there's a big solar array that is down so it's close enough that the uh, um, I'll start this again maybe we can see it it's close enough to the yeah so that first thing that flipped out was power okay see that thing right there it's underneath the uh, that little flap that's a, a solar array right there uh, the shade is on the telescope side. This is the spacecraft side, so that's pointed towards the sun. And the Earth, uh, so the actual orbit, which leads me to the next slide, uh, it isn't exactly behind the Earth. It actually is orbiting the L2 point. So let me uh, get back to full slideshow here. And we will go to the next slide. All right, so... As, uh, so here's the sun, here's the earth, and here's the L2 point. It's orbiting the L2 point. And this is another little video, which I thought it was uh, nice to sort of uh, see. So it's doing a halo orbit about L2. So it's going essentially around, above, and below the whole time. And we'll change our perspective. So as we look from the earth to the sun, so JWST is doing this the whole time. So it's always, um, you know, viewing the sun on the sunshade side. Um, and so it, it gives you the best sort of uh, thermal stability. Okay, all right. Well, that's James Webb. I'm really excited that it's going to launch soon. Um, the decadal survey for 2010, which happened uh, while James Webb was being built, uh, the winner was the Roman Space Telescope. So let's talk about that. So this, like Hubble, is a 2.4 meter entrance pupil diameter. Uh, the field of view is about 50 by 25 arc minutes, so it's much bigger field of view than Hubble, and that's the main thing that the uh, Roman brings. Uh, it's an F8 system, so it's faster, so it's uh, uh, faster than Hubble, and the wavelength range is uh, a little bit shifted to the infrared compared to Hubble. It's 0.5 to 2 microns. Because it's a bigger field of view, we're back to a three-mirror design, right? So Hubble was a two-mirror design, bigger field of view for Roman. We're doing a three-mirror uh, anastigmat design. The survey was in 2010, and the launch is going to be 2027 currently. Okay, it, uh, who is Nancy Grace Roman? Well, she is often considered as the mother of Hubble. Um, and she was uh, essentially our first chief astronomer who paved the way for space telescopes to focus on the broader universe. So she was one of the ones who really founded the astrophysics uh, effort, uh, telescopes looking away uh, from the sun, away from the Earth, uh, doing uh, basically astrophysics. Because uh, some of NASA's first telescopes were uh, as, uh, looking at the sun, I believe. Uh, short wavelength telescopes looking at the sun. Uh, Roman will study dark energy, right? So there's this big uh, question about uh, the universe is that, uh, you know, dark energy uh, contains 73% of everything and dark matter 22%. Uh, and everything else that we can see is about 4.6%. So this is not really well understood. So uh, how do we do that? Well, we look at the sky um, as much as we can and infer uh, what's going on uh, through gravitational lensing and other techniques that astronomers have to do this. But you need a wide field of view, and you need to uh, sort of sort of like uh, LSST, where you're constantly surveying uh, across the sky as much as you can. That's going to be the kind of the main operation mode for Roman for uh, studying dark energy, just, uh, just uh, to um, look across the sky as much as possible. There is one interesting, um, so my, um, there is another interesting thing uh, that uh, Roman is carrying aboard, and it's a uh, chronograph instrument, and it's a technology demonstration instrument. Um, so uh, it is essentially going to be one of the first uh, uh, chronographs uh, uh, that are going to be able to hopefully uh, uh, see uh, planets around nearby stars. So it's going to be uh, uh, pretty awesome, uh, assuming all goes well with it. So the chronograph instrument is considered a technology demonstration instrument because uh, uh, it's not allowed to slow down the schedule of the telescope. It has to be ready on time or it, 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 there'll be a, a lead weight in its place uh, and to keep the mass going. So I'm sure it'll be fine, uh, but, uh, but it's uh, just uh, how, how everything worked out with, with the mission. Uh, all of the hardware currently is in Rochester, New York. If any of you are going to the Mirror Technology Days, uh, which is a, uh, a meeting that the government holds every year talking about the money that it puts into the industry and academia in order to better mirror technology, um, there is going to be a tour of the 2.4 meter primary mirror. This telescope right here was not originally planned to be uh, a NASA telescope. This was a gift from a sister agency. 
um, in the Department of Defense uh, that they had two extras that they uh, partially funded but didn't finish. And NASA was directed to use this for our dark energy mission. Uh, that was an interesting time. I was on the, uh, uh, the dark energy mission concept where we had settled on a, essentially a smaller telescope design that was unobstructed. And then once these gifts were given to us, we were directed, okay, use this. <laughs> and so we had to modify our, uh, our design to, to um, what the prescription of the primary and secondary here was, which uh, was interesting because you could sort of figure out what the original design purpose of this was based upon the, you know, the figure of the primary and secondary that were given to us because uh, it clearly wasn't a Cassegrain design or a Ritchie creation design. It was designed for something else. Um, anyway, we had to make it fit in the box, so to speak. But uh, in the end, I think we're going to get more science because there's a lot more uh, collection area. Um, it makes coronography a bit harder, though, because you've got the struts, the six struts uh, that, are, that are obstructing the primary mirror. Um, and uh, I don't have a picture of the aperture, but maybe I do here. Uh, well, anyway, that'll be in a future talk. But, but there, are six struts, uh, the spy, there are six spider struts that hold the secondary mirror for this uh, uh, system. So how do we do? Um, for Astro 2010, and another comment about that is uh, when I was chatting with faculty, uh, I know everybody's uh, anxiously, uh, um, uh, astro, these, uh, the astro uh, decadal surveys aren't just about space telescopes. Um, they're also about ground telescopes, and that's a big part of what goes on at the University of Arizona. But for the space telescopes, how, how well did NASA do? I mean, we get this advice, and this is what you should be doing. Um, so the recommendation, uh, the top recommendation for 2010 was uh, W first, which uh, essentially became Roman Space Telescope. Well, it's in phase C, launched by 2027, so check. Hey, we're taking care of that. Uh, they also recommended a bunch of explorers, um, and all of these went out. Uh, Lisa uh, said we need to do some sort of contribution for this, uh, this uh, gravity wave mission with ESA, and that, that partnership was established, and that's going to be in the mid-2030s uh, launch for that. Like so partnered with uh, ESO on that. And if you go through all this, uh, all of these uh, boxes are checked for everything. So uh, NASA did pretty well, I think, uh, for the Astro 2010 scorecard. Uh, the only one we didn't do is we elected not to participate in SPICA. Uh, that was uh, uh, you know, far down on the list, and you can't do everything. Um, but uh, the number one is uh, the one that's going, and that's, that's why it's interesting. Uh, for, 20, for the next decadal survey, I'm going to quickly go over the concepts that were done for that. Um, so four concepts were presented for large missions to the decadal survey. And these four concepts were uh, habitable planet explorer. So this is essentially a large coronagraph type mission that's going to look for planets uh, around nearby stars. Louvoir, which is a general astrophysics mission, but it also has an exoplanet component. Lynx, which is an X-ray surveyor, uh, looking at dawn of black holes, galaxy structure of the evolution. So now we're looking at a really short wavelength here. And then the origin survey telescope, which is uh, basically a very long wavelength um, uh, consideration. So uh, HABEX, the concepts that were looked at by uh, NASA teams at NASA and other, other groups, uh, HABEX is a four meter unobstructed design with a 30 by 30 arc minute field of view. Uh, so this is a, it's actually an afocal design, but it's a 2.5 uh, F number at the cast focus, unobstructed afocal TMA with an 80 magnification. Uh, there's four science instruments planned for it, plus a guider, 72-meter uh, external star shape for coronography, and a smaller option um, uh, descopes that. The uh, uh, Louvoir is, uh, uh, there's two concepts for that. Uh, this is the big one. So it's a 15-meter entrance pupil with 120 segments, okay, 10 by 8 arc minute field of view. It's an F20 design, just like James Webb, 0.1 to 2.2 micron, so it's more in the, uh, uh, short wavelength, well, it's, it's the Louvoir stands for Large UV Optical IR Telescope, so this uh, covers that. It's a three-mirror design concept currently, just like James Webb, and four science instruments associated with it. Um, the smaller option looks like this. It's an unobstructed version, but it's only eight meters, and it, uh, also it's an F36, uh, uh, and it's an unobstructed TMA with four science instruments. Lynx um, looks like a lot bigger Chandra, essentially. So it's a Walter Schwarzschild Type 1 design in this case, uh, but half a arc second resolution, and uh, F3.3 with 20 by 20 arc minute, uh, three meter aperture, so it collects a lot more light. Uh, and Origins is a uh, nine meter uh, aperture, 37 segments, uh, big field of view, 25 by 15 arc minutes, F13, unobstructed TMA, five science instruments. 
And uh, there's a smaller concept for Origin, which is a monolith in case, uh, in case uh, segmented systems don't work out for NASA. Uh, 5.9 meter, 18 segments, uh, 40 by 15 arc minutes, F14 system, uh, TMA. And um, the winner of the 2021 will be found out next week. So tune in. Uh, this is really exciting. The announcement was just made. So at this time next week, um, well, a little bit before, so that's what, 2 p.m. Eastern time, so that makes it uh, 11 a.m. here, I guess. Well, actually, no. Daylight savings happens this weekend, so it's going to be noon, your time, next week. Um, uh, there will be a public briefing on what happens, but the report will be pushed out uh, uh, that morning. So when you wake up in the morning, you can download the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey Update and see what the big winner is going to be. It's going to have the ground-based stuff, it's going to have the space-based stuff, all that sort of thing. Uh, I often get asked the question about, you know, why is JWST lasting so long? Well, if you do the math b between the decadal survey time and the actual build times for each one of these, you know, there's a little bit of fluctuation, but it's not as much as you think. Yes, James Webb's a little bit high. You know, it's over. It's about 20 years right now. Uh, but, um, but, you know, the plan of the other ones are, are balancing it out. Um, I had an intern recently, and I love the bubble plots, uh, and I asked her, to take all these flagship observatories plus a few extra and, uh, you know, plot the F number of the telescopes and the field of view associated with the telescopes. And, and this is sort of what you get uh, when you do that sort of uh, spread F number field of view. And that bubble chart that I showed you earlier with the free form up here, if you drop it on here, this is kind of what you get. So if you look at it, uh, these blue squares are the three mirror anastigmats, right? So we got uh, uh, Roman and JWST, and they're actually down here, whereas the TMA is up here, and then the, the triangles are the two mirror designs, like the Ritchie Creation designs, and they're down here, whereas Ritchie Creation is here. Uh, we do have Kepler up here, which is a little bit beyond what the Schmidt is listed. So the bubble chart, we probably need a NASA bubble chart, which is a little bit different than this bubble chart. But anyway, uh, it's just a, a, a one check on the bubbles. But <laughs> I thought this was a, a fun little exercise. So thank you. Um, the worm is back, so you're going to start to see that a lot more at NASA. And uh, finally, uh, are there any questions? And happy Halloween. Uh, question. <laughs> uh, why did Chandra retire before Hubble? Chandra? Uh -huh. Chandra's still flying. I think it's getting science. Uh, did I? And you mean Spitzer? Yeah. Oh, Spitzer. Yeah. So Spitzer had a. Uh, so the first thing that happened with Spitzer is there was a cryostat. So it basically we launched it with a big uh, ice cube, if you want to think of it, in order to keep it cold. So the instruments that were working at the super cold could only last so long because that, uh, that, that cryostat, that block of ice that holds the detector cold, eventually melts off, it vents off. And then the near, the, but the higher uh, wavelength one, um, uh, it was working until just the last uh, couple years. And the reason why it retired might have been it slowly degrades. I think there was some, um, um, you know, space is a harsh environment for space telescopes. So it slowly degrades, and I think uh, the funding uh, available to operate something uh, is also a factor as well because when you have a bunch of people that are doing uh, manning the mission operations center and you need time on the communications in order to talk to it which costs money as well and uh, it's just the, the amount of science that it was producing probably didn't justify the limited budget in order to keep things going and uh, when I, I'm not in the program office to, to make that decision but I mean if you look at the science that Spitzer is producing or the science of Hubble. And if you have a choice, then, you know, Hubble is probably going to win just because it's just, uh, uh, Hubble is continuously producing amazing science uh, for the community. Why is the uh, time scale between, you know, being accepted and actually launching these devices sort of so narrowly distributed around 17 years? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's just, uh, I just did that for fun because people always ask me, um, so it's, uh, the first thing that happens when you're accepted for high priority science is that uh, you, you start to do design concepts. And so the scientists meet with uh, a lot of the, the engineers, including optical designers like myself, say, you know, these are the fundamental things that we need. Uh, for example, James Webb. 
So we need diffraction, Im uh, diffraction limited imaging at two microns. Okay, that's uh, because of that two micron level because we want to see the, the baby pictures of the universe kind of thing. And uh, it's got to have enough resolution, so it needs to be this big aperture. Well, the first thing is, okay, how are you going to get that big aperture? Uh, are we going to use hexagonal segments? Are we going to use other segments or pie-shaped segments or whatever? And so that all went on here. And then you have to figure out what's going to survive cold. So there are all these material studies. And we finally said, okay, they're going to be hexagonal segments, and they're going to be made of beryllium, even though we considered ULE and other options as well. And the next thing you have to do is to verify, uh, to bring to a technology readiness level, TRL-6, which is uh, kind of the, the baseline, you know, from one to nine, nine meaning you, you've flown it and it's proven out, and one just a basic concept. You have to bring it up to a minimum level of acceptance before you actually, you know, uh, build the telescope or go through your major reviews. And so there's a lot of technology development which lasts a few years early on. And then in order to launch it by a certain date, you have to get your key reviews done, your preliminary design review, your critical design review. And uh, for flagship missions, it appears to be about a 15 to 20 year pipeline. So um, there's probably a better reason, but that's kind of... There's a lot to do once you figure out what you need to do. Charlotte? Yeah, um, so you mentioned that one of the newer telescopes has a monolith design in case the hexagonal segments don't work out. So I guess, can you talk a little about what the like co-phasing design is and are there like backup plans almost to how that's going to work between all the segments? Oh, for James Webb? Yeah. Okay, so for James Webb, uh, we are using, in order to phase all these segments, we're using image-based phase retrieval methods. So this was a concept developed uh, when we found Hubble's error. Uh, we didn't know what's going on. So um, um, a bunch of guys, um, including a gentleman named Jim Finup, um, who's currently at the University of Rochester, uh, said, well, let's take you know, out-of-focus images because we can find out more of what's going on. And if you do you know, a lot of uh, Fourier transform between the pupil and image plane, that sort of stuff, you can figure out, oh, look, we have spherical aberration. And then um, one team went off to figure out, oh, where did all the spherical come? aberration came from, and, it, and then they figured out it came from the test setup in order to polish a mirror. And the other team figured out, okay, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to fix this? Um, but anyway, with that method of phase retrieval that was developed for Hubble, uh, it's extremely powerful uh, in that you can have one of your instruments in the back. In fact, the instrument that was uh, is led by Marsha Ricci here at the University of Arizona um, at, over at Stewart. She, uh, part of her near-infrared instrument has a few lenses in it to basically take out-of-focus images uh, of, of uh, what, what we're looking, the star that we're looking at. And so those out-of-focus images tell us what the phasing error is of all these 18 segments. But before you even get there, uh, you have to actually stack. Uh, so what are we going to see at first light? Well, we're going to see 18 images of the star, right? <laughs> Because uh, there's going to be tiny tip tilt differences of all these mirrors. And once you find the 18 images of the star, which you may have to tile uh, the space, by the way, then you bring them all together, and then you stack them. And then we actually have a little grism uh, in order to do the, the major piston shifts. But once we get the major ones down to under a micron, say, then you do the, the fine phasing, which is your, your phase retrieval method. So it's a convergent alignment method that's well proven out. We have, uh, we've done it on a test bed. And uh, many of you I've heard uh, just in the talking with faculty are using phase retrieval methods and some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, so, so that's the plan. Now, uh, how will it work if something breaks? Uh, so uh, it's gracefully, um, there's a lot of redundancy built in. So each one of these segments has six degrees of freedom. So there are six actuators in the back. The actuators all have redundant windings. Um, if one of them gets stuck in a certain position, then uh, one possible uh, 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 something to do with it is if you can point it far enough away out of your field of view, as long as you're careful where you look that it's not bringing light into the system from, where, uh, from a bright source, then you can have a 17 segment aperture, right? Um, what are other things that can be done? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, there, it, the main thing is we test everything as it flies. There's lots of redundancy. Uh, each one of the windings are redundant. Um, uh, but there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of mechanisms that have to work right, and and uh, by testing it and repeatedly testing it, uh, that's how we can uh, uh, you know everything will work. So. We're non-square, mm -hmm. um, but some of them are square, and I'm curious what drives that these uh, non-square fields of view. 
So I don't have that uh, plot here, but for example, James Webb is actually four different instruments. Um, so for what do I report for James Webb? I think I reported a rectangular field of view, 20 by 10, right? Here we go. So uh, the telescope itself gives 20 by 10 arc minute field of view. But if you, if you, let's say this is your field of view that it's producing. Well, you got one instrument here. You got one instrument up here, another instrument over here, and maybe a, a fourth instrument down here. And so it's just this, the telescope itself, what it's providing is what I'm reporting right there. Each one of the individual instruments may only be a two by two arc minute field of view or a, um, a, uh, you know, a four by four arc minute field of view. But it's just the way that they're tiled in the image surface and that's what I report right here. Uh, yes, for James Webb, there are simultaneous operations. Uh, but uh, uh, for example, uh, one of them is a fine guider but part of the fine guider is a, um, it's nearest, it's the near infrared, um, um, I forget what the IS stands for, but it's a, but it's a near infrared instrument as well. But yes, uh, simultaneous operations can occur. So the fast bearing mirror is not to select a field of view, to select the field of view of the entire observatory moves, right? So we have reaction wheels that actually steer the observatory to a new uh, pointing angle in the sky. Now, since this is a big floppy structure made of uh, carbon fiber, essentially, uh, it's very stable, but, uh, but you know, things might jiggle a little bit, you know, the jitter. This fast steering mirror just controls that jitter in the line of sight that results from maybe, maybe there's a teeny bit of wobble in the secondary mirror because of uh, reaction wheels. Uh, another source of uh, jitter in the system is the cryocoolers. I, I told you about the mid-infrared instrument. There's an active cooler. And so that thing's going ka-chunka, chunka, chunka, chunka. And then, you know, so the secondary mirror might be wobbling a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, just these moving mechanisms that are required for the telescope uh, may cause uh, frequencies that cause uh, slight vibrations. And the fast steering mirror has a feedback loop with one of the, with, with one of the, uh, uh, one of the instruments, the fine guidance sensor, in order to control tip tilt to hold it locked down on the sky to within seven milli arc seconds. So. It is image based. It's doing FFTs on the point spread function, basically to centroid it. So it's the, there's no wavefront sensor associated with it. It's just purely uh, centroiding with a, a small window on a detector for a particular guide star. And so it, it closes the loop and it's uh, seven milli arc seconds is the budget. So the pixels for the near infrared camera uh, on James Webb are about 30 milli arc seconds or so. So that's about a, eh, a quarter of a pixel. So we get the jitter down to that level. Yeah, they do actually. And then I, I do a freeform talk and I actually focus, I, I talk about that. But okay, where do freeform fit in here? Louvoir. So there's four instruments associated with Louvoir. Uh, one or two of the instruments uh, had freeforms in it. Okay. Uh, origins. This whole thing, the original telescope planned for it was like a total freeform telescope. That's a far infrared telescope, right? So why not go freeform, right? <laughs> Uh, when the longer the wavelength, uh, you can get really jamming big fields of view for that sort of thing. But the, uh, some of the instruments were considered uh, here for freeform. So definitely Louvoir and OST. Habex has a tiny field of view, right? Because its goal is to look at a sort of a single star and look at the planets next to the star. So whenever you're dealing with a system that has a small field of view, freeforms might not be needed. Uh, but Louvoir, general astrophysics, big fields, but exoplanets are important as well. Then you're then for this right here, you know, yeah, let's throw in free forms because that'll really help uh, uh, help resolve issues, um, you know, maybe weight, mass, or packaging or something like that. So yeah, two of the four definitely had free forms in the design. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Lynx, uh, but this is your Walter, you know, grazing incident type design. Um, and and Habex, I, I had some insight too, but this is, Habex was designed to be uh, something that is, you know, immediately buildable now and it's reasonable. We can do this right away. Whereas Louvoir is, okay, this is going to be development, maybe similar to, you know, another 17 to 20 year type development sort of thing. So. I have a few questions. The first one is, what is the stable gravity points? What do you mean by that, the Lagrange? Oh, so for the Lagrange gravity points? Yeah. So think of the gravity well. Have you ever seen a, like a, a picture of how gravity impacts space-time kind of thing? It shows a big well. So 
imagine, you know, you've got uh, 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 maybe one good way to explain it is uh, a big membrane, right? If you've got a big membrane here and you put a big heavy ball there, it's going to be uh, dipping down. Well, now if you put a lighter ball where the earth is, it's going to, you know, at some point, this big well here and where the earth is, because it sinks a little bit, it's going to be a point where the slope is zero. Right, okay, that's a Lagrange point, right? Uh, so right between, at some point between the earth and, 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 the, and the sun, you know, you know, you're going to have that zero slope. So that's a stable, it's an unstable equilibrium point, right? If you're on either side of that point, you're going to roll into the sun or you're going to go to the earth, okay? Um, I think, uh, let's see, I, I forget which ones are stable and which ones are unstable. Like if you put a, uh, a pebble, uh, uh, some of these, if you put a pebble but slightly off, it'll stay in that point. And I believe L4 and L5 are stable points because these are like the Trojan um, asteroids uh, between Jupiter and the sun. And we just launched a mission called Lucy that's sending out a, a probe to check these out. Right, so L4 and L5 uh, are stable points. I think L3, uh, I'm not sure if L3 is unstable, but L2 is unstable. So if you actually put a pebble at L2, uh, then it would slowly go away. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, it's very, the slope is very, very benign, and so it's easy to use minimal propulsion in order to operate around that point. Right. Uh, the resolution of light is to extend Uranus to the launch of the James Webb telescope. So Europe contributed the rocket. If it's going to be their rocket, they can launch it from their facility. Okay. So money and partnership. Uh, okay. uh, not the location. I'm sorry? Not the job the location. That doesn't really have to... Uh, the European chose French Guiana for the for the ESA launch facility because it's close to the uh, it's close to the equator. So you get the biggest throw, less fuel to get to space, that sort of thing. Okay. My last question is a general question. Like, I always wonder: is there a need for a space army? Like, in case we get there are secret aliens, so is there like a uh, all, all the uh, countries combined like, together for a space uh, army, like to defend ourselves? Is so there? Is that NASA So recently, uh, there was the Space Force was uh, founded by uh, uh, our, our, our previous president, and I don't know how big it is, but I'm sure there are plans to do something like that. Because I, I was in the Navy, and I know one thing about uh, um, the military in general is you always plan for something. Whether or not you have the money to do it is different, but there's always this planning, and I'm sure there's some sort of uh, yeah, capability. Space Force is USA specific. It's like USA versus the rest of the countries. Uh -huh. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, maybe the UN is thinking about something like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Guide star, are you looking for? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the guide stars generally need to be bright because uh, when you, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But since you're only looking at uh, a, a small readout of um, uh, you know, 8 by 8 or 16 by 16 pixels on, on that, and you're doing it fast because you want to get really quick uh, feedback, generally you want a brighter star that's in your field of view. And with the JWST field of view, um, the fine guider, there's two fine guiders, each with a 2 by 2 arc minute. And, uh, and it was designed that way because anywhere we look, if we have two two arc minute windows that we can look through, we can always find uh, one guide star in order to do our guiding anywhere on the sky. So that, that was part of the definition of the field of view needed for the fine guiding, uh, for the fine guider itself. So the field of view for James Webb is uh, uh, it's a rectangular field of view and the fine guiders are kind of at the top. Um, so even if the guidance is happening here, down at the other instruments, they're still getting pretty stable, although sometimes you can get a teeny bit of rotation about the guide star from the fine guider, right? But uh, that's, cut, that's all budgeted and, and the image quality uh, for, the, for the systems engineering that goes on. And, uh, and yeah, it's just all budgeted. So it, it's essentially the, the fine guiding is really, really good at the point of the guider itself, but then it can degrade out to such that you get seven milli arc seconds of, of, of smear or whatever it might be uh, that, that's far away on the other side of the field of view of the telescope. So, yeah, you're welcome.